the upgraded setup. The upgraded setup, dude. <laughs> Episode 45, Sean. Sean Dalkey, half-hearted vocalist. All the good shit, dude. I realized What's last up? time you were here was episode five. So exactly 40 episodes ago. Wow. It was January of this year that you were here. Um, yeah, lots changed. Last time we were here, it was just against this wall. Now we're in the corner. We got the new mics, headphones, the mixer. Yeah. Added the new green shit last night. <laughs> so we're getting there. We're slowly, slowly making this into a home for us. It's cool. Um, dude, thanks for coming by. Of course. Obviously, we're here. First things first. Love Mistake is out now everywhere. Uh, anyone who's listened to this and hasn't listened to that first should go fix that. Yes, <laughs> go take please. care of that first. That is a way more entertaining listen. We worked, we both worked way harder on that than we will on this in the next hour or so. Definitely. <laughs> um, so yeah, go check out Love Mistake. Stream it everywhere. Uh, it's out now, dude. Anything else you want to plug up top before we get into shit? I like to any shows coming up, any uh, you're producing stuff. Where do people reach out to pr- get you to produce stuff? Uh, you can hit me up on social media or go on my website, shondalkey.com, and there's like a little contact button, and like a form to fill out. Easy. Yeah. Easy money, and they'll yeah. make it happen. Uh, cool. Love Mistakes is out now. Uh, going right back into the origins of this thing. Yeah, where does this song idea start? Obviously, it's like it strikes me as like a... Sex so is a heartbroken song, which always strikes me because I know you're in a happy marriage. And so I'm always curious, like, where does all this heartbreak come yeah. from? And so, where do these stories start for you? This specific song is actually a really funny story because it wasn't written for half-hearted. Okay. So uh, it was, I'm, I'm still doing a bunch of, like, writing for other people and mm-hmm. stuff. And I had an artist that I work with reach out to me, and they were like, hey, I want you to write me a song that's kind of along the lines of just, like, like a too close to touchy like kind of ballady rock song oh yeah and i was like okay cool so you know went into the studio a couple hours later just cranked out without thinking like boom top line here we go and i sent it to the artist and i sent it to jay at the same time okay and artist hit me back and was like perfect exactly what i'm looking for jay hit me back you can't give this away this has got to be for us (laughs) so uh, reached back out to the artist who's thankfully like a really good friend of mm. me and Jay's okay. explain the situation. And it, there was like a, a long time between like when I wrote that song for him and when he was going to come record it. Okay. So like okay. we yeah, had yeah. some time to sit on it and like, you know, it was, it, it wasn't like an abrupt, like, here you go, <laughs> take it back kind of thing. Um, and he was really cool with it. He like makes jokes about it still. And we hang out, like Gee, he like okay. made it, he made made a t-shirt that says like half-hearted stole my song and shit like (laughs) but it's like it's become like this funny like inside joke and stuff and um yeah so was it uh in the writing process was this song that came out of your head in two hours or was it something like did you was it an idea like there was where does it start i guess it's the best way to ask that question of yeah is it poured out of your head in, in 30 minutes or is there a riff you're stuck on for a while and then it takes shape over a longer period of time it was originally i made like a little just like synth patty kind of loop, just something that sounded kind of sad and like ambient and like whatever, Mm -hmm. um, just to kind of set a tone. And then I wrote the whole top line over that. And then once we actually decided, and I was writing a lot of it with this artist in mind. So um, once Jay ultimately decided like, hey, this is gonna be ours, (laughs) I ended up changing the key um, so I could sing it a little higher uh, scrapped the entire second verse because it didn't feel like me like rewrote a, a whole second verse. Mm-hmm. So like it did go through a lot of changes after mm-hmm. that happened to make it more of a half-hearted song. And originally like there wasn't going to be like the heavy like breakdowny part mm-hmm. and like whatever. It was going to be more of a chill like rock song. Um, so we definitely took the original like idea top line and like really half-heartified it. I yeah. guess. <laughs> I like that. I like that as a verb. <laughs> but. Uh, but yeah, that original idea was just kind of like a little synth loop thing I made on a pad and a top line for someone else Damn. that... Shout out King Bird for having the vision there. Yeah, right? That. When you get the text from Jay, is it like a, yo, Jay, fuck you. Like, I can't just tell this guy no. Or is it like a, yeah, you're right. This should be a, like, yeah, what was your initial reaction there? It was, I, I definitely got it. Like, it, it came out cool. Yeah. And I saw like... There was definitely parts of it that I was just like, nah, this doesn't really feel like a half-hearted song, like like that mm-hmm. second verse and whatnot. Um, but the chorus was like really what caught him. He mm-hmm. was like, that feels like a you chorus, like something that you would do for us. And I was like, all right, mm-hmm. I get that. Like Jeez. you're you're right. It mm-hmm. does. You know, I could definitely see myself doing that for mm-hmm. us. And then we just kind of reworked the rest until I felt that way about the <laughs> whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, has that ever happened before? That seems like a 
it seems like that would happen more often as you're writing songs to other people that you would get arrive at an idea that feels like yours. Like it, it seems hard to write in so many different voices. And I guess I'm saying this is like, I don't know. I don't have to, I get to build off of what half hearted did. So in a sense, I'm always writing in someone else's voice, but I'm not writing what half hearted should be. I'm writing what I think is the next step of half hearted. What's the evolution of this thing. Yeah. And as you're yeah, writing stuff of like, what are other artists should be? I feel like you would often arrive at something of like, Oh, that should be a half hearted thing. It seems like a common problem that would arise. Yeah. It, it hasn't happened a ton of times. Uh, especially like when I go into something with the goal of like, all right, I'm writing a pop song for this person. Mm -hmm. or like I'm writing a like more R and B song for this person or like whatever. Um, it definitely has that like fine line. Like when I try to write rock stuff for other people, it's like, I really want this to be good for them. But then like when it hits a certain level of like good, it's like, it's not objectively good anymore. It's like good because like now I love it and it feels like me mm -hmm. where it's like, I like to think I'm pretty good at drawing that line of like, okay, this is good, but it's not me. It's like, it's you and it's good you. Mm -hmm. But like that like good me is like not too far away. <laughs> Do you ever run into the issue? And I'm saying this because I just ran into, the, or yeah, I guess I just ran into this issue uh, where I sent something and I sent it to someone and I was like, this is your voice. And they sent it. I was like, I don't think it is. And it was one of those to me of like, no, it is. You just don't want to accept. You don't want like, this yeah. isn't the piece of you that you would like to show to everyone, but this is a piece of you. Uh, and it was an interesting conversation where they were kind of like, I don't know. And I was like, I really think this is it. And normally I'm, I think I'm pretty quick to be like, if you're not sure, then I'm not sure, and let's fix it. Yeah. And this is one of the few times where I was like, no, I, I think you're not I feel like accepting. that's what makes you even better at your job than people see from the outside eye, too. Because, like, yes, your videos turn up really good. But, like, bands like us are able to just be like, here's a song. What do we What do? We do? What do we look like? Yeah. Like, how is this visually going to be rolled out to anybody who listens to it? Yeah. And, like, you're able to be like, oh, it sounds like this. You guys look like this this is what the video should be like. And I feel like that piece of the puzzle is like what a lot of people who can just like work a camera and edit are missing is like, how do you portray this artist to everyone who's going to listen to this song? I appreciate that. Thank you. It's a, a flattering compliment. And I think, yeah, I've been really interested in this idea of voice and perspective. And I think even as a, as a kid, I was always like socially a chameleon where I was happy to hang out with the nerds and the jocks and the musicians. And I kind of enjoyed being able to fit in with them. And I guess the flip side is I never felt like one of them was exclusively my home, but I always enjoyed that yeah. like kind of free floating nature. And I think somehow that's manifested into the band stuff where I really enjoy figuring out for this, these three weeks, all I'm doing is figuring out what is half hearted. And the next three weeks, I'll be moved on to the next set of five guys to figure out what that social circle is and what it should yeah. be. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting I don't know. I think the, the flip side there is I would like to, I don't know. It's nice to have the podcast now where I'm building my own thing as well. I think the one downside there is I end up with a little piece of me and everyone else. And it's like, well, what, what am I then? And so it's nice to have this as like, okay, this is something that I have. And then I can keep putting all these pieces of me and still have an identity of my own mixed yeah, in. Uh, sure. so it's been a fun, a fun process there. But uh, you mentioned the, the freedom of the, yeah, stepping up to a clean slate and going, this is what it should be. And that's how Love Mistakes came together. And of course, that's the complete opposite to me of Insatiable, which was very much like a, you said, here are the 10 things that are going to happen. And I said, okay, let's, yeah. <laughs> let's figure that out. Uh, which a, is rare. It is. Typically, it is. Yeah. typically, especially when I'm writing these songs that are just like, I'm kind of channeling a vibe and I'm just like writing a story. It's like, okay, like now how do I get people to watch? Like when I wrote Insatiable, like I had that video like in my head mm -hmm. while I was writing it. Yeah. Like I was writing the lyrics about that video that hadn't been made yet. And it was so like just satisfying to work it the opposite way and That's be like, wow, oh, now I can watch it. Like <laughs> it now looks like it did in my head, but better than I could have imagined. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And rainier. Yeah, yeah. A little different, a little more in my apartment than we initially yeah. planned, but it all came together I didn't, in there. I didn't think I would be on a motorcycle that day. That's for sure. That's, I <laughs> forgot. Yeah. Uh, as a producer, which one do you prefer? Do you prefer when someone comes in with a, a structure of a song and says, here are the 10 things I need to happen? Or do you prefer, yeah, it sounds like the Love Mistakes origin was someone saying, I need a song. And that's, yeah, a very free approach there. Which one suits yeah. you better, I guess? Um, I don't know. They're both fun in different ways, especially if, if somebody comes to me and they're like, hey, like, I have an idea for a song and I have, like, this demo and I like immediately see what they're going for and mm -hmm. I get the big picture. It's like super easy to just take that and run with it. Mm -hmm. When somebody comes in there more vague, it's like, I know I'm going to, 
do something like cool that I am going to like at the end of the day. And like, I'm going to think this is good, but it's like, you haven't given me much guidance. Like, yeah. is this just kind of like, Hey, make me a song. Like, and I like it now. Like, do you even like it? Like, so is it you as an artist? Is it, is it me? Like, <laughs> is it, neither like <laughs> I feel you 100% I have the same thing with music videos like when you come to me I want you to have an idea and I don't really even care if we use that idea like I'm not necessarily saying I need you to do the the creative work I just need to know that you care that you've put thought into this or you're invested in this idea and yeah. I think one way to do that is yeah coming in with 10 notes and of course the flip side there is when someone comes in with 50 things and they're rigid on all 50 and it's yeah. like well, that's not going to work. Yeah, I mean, why, why am I even here then? You already got this thing done. You yeah. don't need me anymore. Yeah, it's it's equally as frustrating when somebody comes. It, I mean, it's cool if somebody comes with a demo and they're like, here's my song. I just want to like re-record it with mm -hmm. you so Enhance it sounds this. like, you know, we add production and it's mixed well and like it sounds like a final studio production. But it's equally as frustrating when somebody comes and they're like, here's the demo. That's all I want to do is make it sound good. And I'm like, oh, but like it, we can, we can do that. But like, if we reworked this part and this part or like mm -hmm. changed these few things, like it would be just a better song, no matter what the mix sounds like. And they're just like, no, this is my song. It's like, okay, yep. cool. <laughs> I've tried to come around that. I think that there's a lot of growing I can do in those moments of like, when they're rigid on those 50 things, it really forces you to get creative and be like, I wouldn't hit these marks. And I don't know if they're yeah. the marks that I want to hit on every song, whatever, yeah, whatever those feedback and parameters are. But like, it's a good exercise to figure out like, I wouldn't do this, but how do you do that? What does For this sure. thing look like? And sometimes along the way, there's a little fruit that can be found. But yeah. Uh, yeah. And sometimes you stumble along things that are like, you wouldn't normally do mm -hmm. that end up being cool. Or like, I'm not always right. Like if, if I like think like, oh, we should have changed this, should have changed that. And they're like, no. Maybe two weeks later, I listen to it and I'm like, ah, I get why they wanted to do that. Like that definitely did work. Mm -hmm. Like that's just not how I thought about it when they came in or the song gets released and Jay runs ads and everything goes well and everybody loves it. I'm like, well, they were right. <laughs> cool. Yeah. I'm glad I, I'm glad we let, settled on that. <laughs> There's a, a quote up on the wall over there and it's some like dance instructor from uh, the 1900s or something. Some like old old person who is some like mother of dance i don't i couldn't tell you anything really about her but that's the loose summary and one of the the pieces of her uh, quote for idea is like it's not our job to determine how good our art is our job is just to keep doing it and let it flow out of us and the world will decide but if we're trying to make it good then you're never going to get anything out yeah uh, and i always try to keep that in mind as i'm creating these things of like yeah i don't always know what's good but i i trust that if i am satisfied with it. i'm sure in the same with audio it's like by the time the song's out, you've listened to each se each second of it thousands of times, and then the whole song another thousand times in its yeah. entirety. Like hyper focused, right? And you've dissected it. And to me, it's like once I've passed those steps, like it's it's good to some degree. Like I don't know if it's objectively good. I don't know who it's good to, but like yeah, I can't do any more than that dissection to it. Yeah, uh, and it's really hard to listen to a song like for the first time with fresh like a fresh perspective, impossible, and, and get past it. Like mm -hmm. I was just thinking about that on the way here actually because one of the coolest things that can happen like happened on the way here and it was me and Jay were and Crespo were up last night until like two in the morning like writing a new song the Sleepover. last yeah right <laughs> the last song that we needed for not the EP that comes out very soon but the next one um <laughs> fans are always on that next one shit it's the craziest thing to be like man i'm scratching <laughs> clog to stay alive and get to the end of this week and get this week done and yeah. fans are always so far past that because it takes so long to like roll stuff out right so yeah. like the we put out four songs this year because you can only do a song every three months or so sure or you start to step on your own toes mm -hmm. and then you know the last couple songs from that ep will kind of be bundled and put a bow on all those mm -hmm. six songs and put out. And then we've got like three months until we can release single one of the next EP yeah. and just kind of a cycle. So if we're not, by the time we put this EP out, if we don't have the next one written and we can't batch, like have a drum day, have a guitar day, like record everything, then for the next year, we're going to be like chasing our tails, basically. I never, uh, so as you're saying that now, I'm realizing that when, when, if, the, the next EP, let's call it EP1, even though it's not the first, but let's call it EP1. Whenever EP2 comes out, then you haven't received the feedback from EP1 as that's coming together. And I guess at some point in the process Correct. you would. Yeah. But I I always assumed that when... We'll, the, know the, you, we'll know about the singles. 
Sure. Yeah. So yeah. So the the handful of singles we you know have feedback on and stuff, and it kind of. I I also like like I totally get what you're saying, but I also kind of don't like to like lean into that feedback too mm -hmm. much because the feedback that you get most is from like your friends and stuff. And like, I mean, we were just hanging out with Dale last night and he's one of our good friends. He was mm -hmm. over setting up my guitars and we were like doing a tiny mix tweak on one of the songs for, so the EP that we're putting out now, even though four songs are out on it, I don't know if I'm supposed to say it, but whatever. <laughs> it's, I don't know when this episode comes out, but it'll be out tomorrow. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, surprise. Even the ones that we already put out this year all have new mixes. So this whole EP has like the same mix and is very cohesive. Yeah. And like we we're kind of working through um, even having all the songs tracked, like mixing them sort of one at a time to figure out what the overall EP is going to sound like. Mm -hmm. And took bits and pieces from each song that worked and kind of landed on like, all right, this is the sound of this whole EP. So when the EP drops, even the four singles that are already out will be out with new mixes again. So... Uh, I was like making like a little tweak on like one of the, the songs that's already out and played it. And Dale's like, oh my God, like this song is so sick. Like, and we're like, dude, this song's been out for months. <laughs> like you haven't heard it yet. Like, <laughs> so it's like the, the feedback from your closest friends might not be <laughs> on par with your like most coveted listener. I like, think the, the flip side there is like once I'm friends with a band, their music is 10% better sounding to me. And it has nothing to do with the music. It's just that once you know the people, I'm more invested in this idea. And I think yeah. that's part of it is like, yeah, I love Half Heart. And I don't know if that there that, that makes me then unqualified. Like I love you guys as people and that makes me unqualified to judge you guys as an entity. Cause it's like, yeah, you're never the same as Bring Me the Horizon to me. Like you guys are humans, like you're my friends. Yeah, I want to invest in this thing. Yeah. Whereas that's a they're cool, but it's distant, it's foreign, and it's like I don't I don't have a desire to buy in, then support them all. Yeah, consume it when it comes by. Um hell yeah. That's a fun, yeah. fun little thing there. Um yeah. Uh, the video process here. So the video process here is interesting to me because as we kind of touched on, it is a very open process. Uh, and you gave me the feedback of like a decaying city and we kind of talked about like, can we go find a decaying city? And very quickly, it's like, it was funny too. Cause it was like the day that I hit you up the next day was the day that like Brooklyn was like orange. Yep. And, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're like, let's just make it look like that. Like, <laughs> let's make it look like it does right now. <laughs> I forgot about that little piece. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. We were all, I was, yeah, bummed. It's like, I'm not actually going to drive to New York today. No. But like, yeah. damn, it'd be kind of nice if we could. <laughs> yeah. Thank God green screen exists. Uh, but green screen's always like the ultimate blank canvas to me. Because like when, if you come to me and say, uh, you know, let's film music video. When we're on set, like you're seeing it in camera. You're seeing, you know, the whole thing get built. Like you're involved in the process there whereas green screen feels like yeah i showed up in jay's basement and i we drank beers we hung out we filmed some shit yep. and then we went home and you guys were none the wiser about what was going to happen right normally you would have left that day going oh okay i can kind of start to put this piece yeah. together uh and so that always makes it like a scary slate to slight sit down at for me because it's like man this could go anywhere and i have no idea what yeah where this is going to go and where they would feel about that we're normally on set you can you know you set up a red light and they go Oh, does that light apple also have blue? And it's like, okay, you want a blue light? Copy that. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas digitally, it's like I don't quite get that luxury. I'm going to make all these choices, then present the the polished thing to you. Yeah. Uh, and that always makes it kind of a daunting thing, but an exciting problem to solve. There, the the one challenge there was like the skeleton anatomical heart thing. As I was working on that, it was one of those of like, I love this. I think it's cool. But this feels a lot grittier than half hearted. And they might tell me no on this one. And I No, yeah, that I, like shocked us. Like the first time we saw that, like, I mean, I was by myself, but mm -hmm. the first time I opened the video and saw that, just I was just like, Oh, <laughs> okay, cool. Like that's like, yeah, it captured the vibe perfectly. That was yeah. My hope. Yeah. yeah. It, it was I knew we had the city thing and then the the blue kind of came after, but the city thing was my start. And then it's like, well, how do we tie this into love? How do we connect this thing? And yeah, the the body was a the, the next option there i was making myself laugh the other day that like thank god i didn't have to do that practically <laughs> yeah like go and get i mean it's kind of around halloween you could probably find some skeletons you have to use like stuff. a cow carcass or something like yeah. it'd be real fucked up like damn thank god i'm alive in this day and age because yeah. that idea couldn't have happened 20 years ago no. or not as easily for me uh but yeah it's a daunting process there uh is mixing the same for you like is what is that moment like when you send out the mix are you sitting there on i feel like i'm always like on the edge of a cliff of like 
I feel like I'm already like halfway falling off the cliff and I'm just praying the band comes and pulls me back off the edge of the cliff. When you, when you send that thing out, you're like, uh, I don't know about this. Yeah. It's really similar. Like you said, like if you have a band there with you and they can kind of see what's going on and they're like, Oh, switch to the blue light, like whatever, Mm -hmm. like that, that's pretty easy because if I have a band in studio with me, we're making a lot of the big decisions like Mm -hmm. that day, like, you know, we're tuning the drums together. So there's only so much wiggle room you have after you do that. Like your snare is going to sound like this. Does it sound good in front of you? It's going to sound like that on the record. Yeah. Um, this is the type of guitar tones that we dialed in today. Like mm-hmm. everyone's happy with these. Cool. So there's not a ton left for me to do other than make all of the choices we made together work together. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the flip side, when a band just sends me like, here's MIDI for the drums or here's drums we tracked and here's DIs for the guitar mix then it's like all right like and a lot of times it's i'll do what i think is best and then make like backup plans so like interesting and a lot of times the band doesn't see the backup plans like if it's you know any given band like they'll send me stuff i'll mix it i'll do what i think is is best after like having a little conversation with them and we'll send it out and yeah it's kind of like that like Uh, are they going to like this or did I like totally just go a different route than like, cause it's hard to talk about audio, just like video. It's like, how do you talk about sounds and how do you talk about what things look like? And even then your audio vocabulary is so different than mine or the people in the studio where it's like, even if you do tell me, I'm not going to understand what you're expressing. I'm going to understand it through the, the mess of what I've learned on YouTube, what my buddy told me. Exactly. Like I'm not, yeah. yeah I'm truly ingesting what you're yeah, saying. Yeah. Like I'm perceiving, like if you say one word and like you say like, Oh, I'll make this fatter or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like that could mean something totally different to me than it means to you. And <laughs> audio it's like, words are yeah, a mess. It's yeah. just, yeah, it's crazy. You're getting so, a little thinner. It's like, what the fuck is that? Yeah. Like, tell me more reverb. I don't know. That's, yeah. a, I, that's actionable Brighter, to darker, me. Darker, like yeah. bigger, smaller. Like yeah. what, what do, you, what do you mean by that? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's different when I have a band with me than if they send me something. Like if, if I'm just send something, then it's definitely like that. Like, uh, yeah, I hope they like this. They said they wanted a North lane snare, but which North lane album are we talking yeah, about? Right? Which, yeah, yeah. What part of the North lane album did they listen to? And then, uh, like right now I'm working a bunch on the no eye scene record mm-hmm. for that one. Like I've been in, they've been in my studio doing all the vocals and stuff, but all of the, um, instruments were tracked and produced by Wiseman. Oh yeah. So, I'm getting all the instrumental stems like sent to me. And the first day that I did like a test mix for like the actual record, um, I like dialed in like, I want to say five guitar tones, four or five guitar tones. And it was while no, I was on tour and I was like back and forth with them. And I sent them like tone one and I was like, here's the route that I think we should go. But also just so like, you don't have like a knee jerk, like, Oh fuck, this isn't what we wanted. Here's like four more. Because I know, like, with this band, like, me and Lucas talked a bunch about the drums. Like, I know that we've kind of nailed the drum sound. Bass is just going to work around whatever I do with guitar. But these mixes are, like, guitar-focused. Like, your band is guitars. So I wanted that wiggle room of, like, don't think I fucked up. Here's four more options. And they hit me back, and they were just like, no, one's perfect. One is exactly what we were looking for. Like, you were on it. I was like, cool. Good thing I spent the rest of the day on two, three, four. (laughs) That's crazy. I've I've thought about doing that with videos before, and I have never pulled the trigger because I feel like my best bet – I feel like when I send those five things, part of what I'm saying is I'm not really confident in any of these. And I guess in uh, writing the record, it's different because it's not the the final product that you're – a and being it's a small piece of it that you're yeah. a and being i think that's a lot more valuable than yeah i think if i was doing that in like color grades it'd be really useful of like yeah what are this yellow or this orange which one do you like more yeah. um on the flip side like i i try and make sure i'm excited about whatever i'm sending to people even if i'm on the edge of the cliff it's like i still want to present like this is my baby i worked so hard because i think sure. that if you're paying me to work on this thing like if you're inviting me into this intimate process of art creation like i don't think you want me being like like I think yeah. you want me being like, yo, this is the one. And yeah. my flip side there is I don't like I also don't like saying this is the one because I don't want to put you in the spot where it's like, oh, you're now bursting my bubble of how excited I am. So I end up trying to like trying to be like as nonchalant, of like, here it is. <laughs> what do you, you think? figure it out? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you tell me I'm happy or not with it. Yeah. Um, but it is, yeah, it's always this weird balance of like how do you present that thing and how do you make it happen with people? Yeah. Um and in metal, guitar tone is such a like 
stamp of like this is like the vibe of the band it's like it's one of those things where it's like there's not always a right answer it's like all right uh really cool like fat low ND like 5150 sounds really really cool and fits this song but so does like a really mid-rangey like Marshall mm-hmm. type tone and it's like this one sings and this one's fat and yeah both of those work really well for this like which is the vibe of like your band or like this record for your band you know? I think it's also a weird thing of like I'm a metal fan, but I don't think I've ever heard a guitar mix. Like, I'm, I'm sure I have, right? I'm sure as I consume my favorite records, they are also good mixes, and I just don't quite pick up on, like, I don't know, if I eat a food, I don't know that it's a paprika I like. I just know it tastes good, yeah. right? And so I assume guitar tones are a similar thing where I don't appreciate them, but it's a weird thing that, like, there's so much work that goes into stuff that never will make it to most people's consciousness, uh, and that's also a weird part of the process to me. Like, we spend so much time on these fine details, and it's like, I'm not going to stop paying attention to those, but I'm also aware that most people are never going to appreciate oh, sure. this. Yeah. And it's a, a balance I'm always trying to be mindful of, of like, uh, I don't know. There's a, a sentiment there that comes to my mind that like things are usually done at 80% and not that I should stop 80% of the way into things, but normally by that point, like everything else is just tinkering and fine details. And like, that's for me. And yeah. Whatever anyone else is going to perceive, like it's already kind that's of to make set you in think stone. it's perfect. Yeah. 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 And yeah. it's all completely ex- extra to what anyone else is ever going to see yeah. and consume there. I feel like our job is basically like if nobody notices anything is off and they can perceive the like song or video start to finish without mm-hmm. their brain focusing on one thing or like yep. being like, eh, about one thing. If they can just take in like, oh, I like this song yep. and there's not they're not nitpicking things out. Cause like, I don't really care if somebody like listens to a song or like a mix I've done and they're like, oh, cool guitar tone. Like just is it good overall or is it bad overall yeah. if if you can sit down and just comfortably perceive the entire project and be like cool yep. then job job well done <laughs> i always use the referee analogy of like if you don't know the ref was on the field and they did a good job like if they threw the flag yeah. when the flag was supposed to be thrown and they kept it in their pocket when it was supposed to be in their pocket yep. like mission accomplished and yeah i agree with you that i think that's kind of where our sweet spot is uh which is also a strange one cuz it's like I didn't get into this to be in the background. Like to some degree, we kind of want to be on stage. We want to be under the lights. And it's yeah. a strange balance there. But it's like, yeah, I don't want my video to distract from this thing. But I also don't want to just put in something that's bland that people will just watch. Like there is some some risk you have to take there. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, but if it was bland too, then they would not perceive the whole thing as like really sick. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there wouldn't be anything jumping out at them like, oh, I liked this part so much or whatever. Like, yep. but just comfortably watching or listening to like start to finish and being like, that was good. Like, yes, I run into this a lot. And I think the more I create things, the more I run into the problem of like, I want to make things unique, but the more things you make, the harder it is to make something unique. And you become aware of like, these are the, the, I have a pet peeve with white wall music videos. And to me, it's like, they all look cool, but I've seen every single one of them. And I couldn't tell you a single one I've ever seen. Like they just, they are all one thing. And it feels like a, a thing you can settle into and go, these are cool. And I agree that they are cool, but like it, it feels like a formula that it's like, yeah, we can put you in this formula, but who gives a fuck? Yeah. But the more I create, the more I find myself, like I, you know, someone reaches out and says, Hey, what are this video? And I go, Oh, there is, it could just be this. And this would get the video done easily and it would get it done without pain. And we're all going to be happy in the end, yep. but there's nothing in it for me. There's nothing that makes me excited and keep the, keep the ball rolling there. And I think that's a, a weird balance to find in the context of being the referee of being an omniscient personality. It's like, I do want to take chances and make this thing ambitious, but you're right. I don't want to be noticed. I want to let this thing breathe and be as it is. And there's a really fine line there of like, yeah, I don't want to. And I also can't put a million hours in every video. Like at some point you have to say this video can take up my week or it can take up my two weeks. I can't put six months into this video. Like we just don't have the budget and the resources or the, any logical need for that. Um, and it's always this balance of like, yeah, I want to take risks and I want to be ambitious there, but uh, there is a, a routine here. Yeah. As you create more no stuff. No real guns on set. <laughs> <laughs> as you create more, is it tough to, like, I assume there's something in audio where you hear bridges or chorus structures or the 038 chorus or whatever the traditional thing is. Like, is it is it tough not to lean on these tools that are so easily accessible and tried and true successful? I think... That's especially lately one of the biggest things I've been focused on when like writing and producing for people is like just getting away from the like 
verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. It's like, cool, like, even if we do that, how can we make it so, like, every time the chorus hits, it feels fresh? Or, mm -hmm. like, you know, each verse is, like, feels different. Like, how do we make it so, even though the top line is structured, like, every fucking song ever almost like how can we make it so people are like oh this is still interesting and it's mm -hmm. still like part of an experience and like they partially are like expecting this is about to happen but then when it does they're like oh that was cool though yep. like you know what i mean so it's like you want to like lean on things enough for it to feel familiar to people the first time they listen to it but also experiment enough so it still feels exciting even yeah. though they kind of and feel familiar i guess i'm uh as i'm my voice in my head is going off and my, my anxiety it's like i'm not above that either right like i also fall into these things and to bring it back to love mistakes to me it's like the my initial goal there was to have the heart like pumping and watch this thing like slowly slow down and pumping and as i got to do i was like that's just not gonna happen i don't have the time to do it. i don't have the resources i don't have the skill to do it. like i just yeah. i can spend 100 hours doing that <laughs> or i can finish the whole video in 30 hours like which one yeah what am i gonna do here uh and so quickly then it was like okay well something needs to grow and change over time i don't want the video to be stagnant um and so one of the ways i tried to solve that problem is in the blue scenes all the people are always like rearranged each time you see mm -hmm. them which is a very like subtle thing and i don't know if that is picked up everywhere but it to me helps like break up of like there are three scenes and i think if i'm being super critical of myself the knock there would be the three scenes are kind of rigid like there is the blue there's the bones and there's the city and the, the buildings aren't falling over the blue isn't blowing up like it's i think it looks cool and i'm very proud of what i created i don't want to yeah shit on it but if there was a 110 percent version of it i think yeah it's something that grows and changes uh and so i picked on the yeah the blue scene to create the uh, variety there and in the city there's a similar effort um the flip side there is as that scope gets bigger it becomes harder to make everything perfect and everything work well in the city scenes, there's a couple of walls that are just missing in, in the Parker shots. I nice. don't know if you've picked up on them or if they are. It's one of those things that I caught late and just never could get 100%. Every time you fix one, like 10 more would pop up. Sick. And I have no <laughs> idea how it happened. Like it, the, it makes no sense to me. We're like the way it's built, I don't know how this one piece got deleted. And I think if that got deleted, a bunch of other stuff should have gone missing too. But there's like the the alleyway that people are in in the city and there's yeah just one of the like building fronts behind parker is just gone like i don't know what sweet i, I have no idea how it happened it made me so mad as i caught it later on and i did my best to fix it and then as we're watching it back it's like I, you got at some point whatever it is what it nah, is yeah. the building just fell down who cares yeah i didn't notice but it look, i mean the whole city looks so like messed up that it's like one wall missing is, seems is. kind of par for the course. <laughs> it does, except for like the hard edges. To me, it's like I that was the the first lie I justified it to myself with. Well, it's it's a decaying city. And it's like, well, if it was decayed, it, there wouldn't be like a hard edges on the edge of this decay. Gotcha. It would be like the <laughs> rubbly or yeah, some bullshit. You would see that there was something that used to be there. Yeah. But it looks like yeah, just a piece of paper was like lifted out of the wall, uh, which of course isn't isn't accurate. But there is a. I don't know, a moment there of empathy for myself of like, yeah, I bit off a lot and I chewed a lot of it and I got most of it. But sometimes things flip through the cracks. Uh, is that a version in audio? Like, are you at peace with those things when they happen? Do you find yourself beating yourself up over those mistakes? I, I assume there's been a time when you sent out a mix and went, oh, fuck, I didn't realize that got left in there. Or some version of that. Yeah, I mean, and it's a lot of like, I think it's just a perspective thing, too, because like you were saying earlier, like when you're doing the nitty gritty of everything like you're so hyper focused on every second yeah that like it's really hard to pick back up on like the like macro version of it that's mm -hmm. why i love that i have jay because i will work for like a whole day on like this tiny minute detail that no one's gonna notice but i think it's gonna like off the kick just sounded <laughs> a little bit more like this sure. like the whole mix is gonna be perceived better and then i send it to jay and he's just like it's great bass is too loud for the whole song though <laughs> it's like oh I, didn't, I wasn't even thinking about the bass like yeah. you know it's just that whole like just zoomed out perspective can shine light on all those little things that you miss all the time yeah and you touched on it earlier that it's impossible to have that once you've lost it like once yeah. you've zoomed into this micro level and that was the cool thing that happened today that i was saying earlier was we we stayed up and we wrote that song and by you know went to bed at like 3 a.m woke up didn't even remember what the song sounded like basically i was like oh, i kind of remember like the chorus being you know like whatever mm -hmm. and i threw the song on in the car on the way here and i was like wow this is really sick like yeah. i didn't even 
Oh, I didn't even realize story. it was this sick last night. Like it was like listening to it for the first time, yeah. even though we worked on it all day yesterday. I was like, wow. You get like this a great. highway <laughs> hypnosis is the only like parallel I can ever hit now yeah. drive. It's like I was driving for three hours, but I couldn't tell you a single thing I saw in those three hours. Yeah. I think like the flow state of working is a very similar place. And I've had the same thing with videos where you wake up in the morning and it's like, I'm going to be real happy or real sad yeah. in about five minutes from now. And I have no idea what you like, because I don't know what I made. I yeah. think it was cool, but it could be anything in the world. I have no idea what came out And when you're brain. sitting there hyper-focusing, it's like you just miss more than you <laughs> yeah. get. Like you get all the little tiny details, all the technical stuff, yep. but you sometimes miss just like the vibe or just like the overall just yeah. – emotional experience of it where it's like I, I have the headphones that sound like a car and a hundred different mm. other clubs and <laughs> yep. studios and everything yeah. and it's like I can listen to it in all these environments and make sure it's right technically mm. but there's something about just like getting in the car and driving that like I stop thinking about every button I could push and mm -hmm. I'm just like does the song feel right or not yep. and it's just like that new perspective shift is just like magic <laughs> I like that I always wish that like with my own videos that I that I could like put them in like a commercial break of a TV show. Yeah. So like just catch so you off guard. Is, yeah, exactly <laughs> that. Like I feel like I always like sit down and consciously, you know, I put it to my phone, like whatever the, the card check is, whatever yeah. that equivalent is. It's like, yeah, there's a conscious like what's the vibe? Yeah. And I that's Jay's like last step is he puts our song in like a playlist and or like a couple of our songs that we're working on mm -hmm. in a playlist with like other songs of every genre, random that's stuff. Cool. And he'll just hit shuffle and make sure that one of ours doesn't just like you know, catch them off that, guard. Yeah, I guess I could just get a, a the Bad Omens music videos. It all came, like whatever. Yeah, fifty bands yeah. worth of music videos and put them all and toss it in. But I, I'm I'm not gonna sit there and watch it. Like it's just not gonna yeah. happen. But it's easier to listen to music and do other things <laughs> yeah. than sit there and focus on all these videos. Hey, if Elon <laughs> steps his game up, dude, I'll be able to do it while I drive. True. <laughs> we get those True. Teslas going. Yeah, <laughs> that's the next step. Yeah, that metalcore money's got to real grow for that. Really grow for that. Um, I realize this is our 11th half-hearted music video, or my 11th half-hearted video with you guys. So I wanted to dive down the, the memory lane there. Uh, and the, I guess before I move on, is there anything else that stands out with Love Mistakes? Anything else that I, I skipped over in that process or anything in the video that's super interesting that I forgot to mention? No, I think we covered it. it Hell yeah. came out sick. You um, killed it. <laughs> thank you, man. Yes, mission accomplished there. Uh, I'm sure something else will come up in a little bit. But uh, 11 videos. So uh, I guess my question to you is what stands out. And for me, the first piece that always stands out is that this thing... Uh, I talk a lot in here about like legwork and the example I always give is a business card. And I'm sure you remember me handing these out at shows and just yeah. giving people constantly business cards. Uh, and another version of that that I often forget is that this half-hearted thing starts when uh, our first video is May 2020. So I think it's either right as the pandemic starting or right before the pandemic that I start to go... I want to do more than what I'm doing, right? Like I have, I'm, at that point in time, I'm taking a lot of concert photos and I'm enjoying it, but I think I'm ready to do bigger projects and I want to be involved in bigger stuff. But yeah. who's going to, no one wants to hire you for your first music video, right? Like they're happy to hire you for the 10th and the 20th, but the first one's a scary one. So to me, it's like, yeah, how do you, how do I get the foot in the door? And the answer to me was make a free one, make something that I think is cool. And uh, so what comes out of that is the two of us uh, visualizer and it's made in After Effects for me and it's, I watched it the other day and I was... Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. I was <clears throat> happy... Not that I would release it tomorrow, but I it held up better than I thought it would have because yeah. I was remembering it. Uh, oh, yeah. I remember it because I was thinking like uh, Better Without You is the first one. But yep. yeah, no, that one. Yeah. And I remember That's when we... Uh, Jay was just like, oh, like Peter's going to make us like a lyric video or visualizer or something for mm -hmm. this. And I was like, I didn't know Peter did that. <laughs> That's awesome. And yeah. then he sent it and I was like, oh, Peter like... I, does this? I think like, I made like sick. a minute of it and sent it to Jay. Is like, if you want it, it's yours. And yeah. He said, sure, go yeah. for it. And I said, okay, awesome, yeah. cool. Uh, and that stands out as a something I want to be more mindful of. I think as as we get further into this, it becomes harder to accept that legwork is still a part of it. And I think that the legwork is still super important. I don't know that I'm going to go make a free music video for Bring the Horizon tomorrow. Like I don't think that's the the way into that camp. But there is a version of that that I think is always possible and always willing to help our help we're working on sure. and so as i look back at that it's like oh that was a that was a good thing i did that was a good time to like be brave and take a chance and uh for all i knew at the time jay could have equally said no this isn't good enough for us like yeah no bye dude uh, the first time i sold the song i straight up cold called like not called but messaged mm -hmm. like a person and was like hey i wrote this song i think it came out pretty cool doesn't make sense for me to put out but it like lines up with your kind of 
whole mm-hmm. vibe and brand and everything. And they hit me back and they were like, yes. Like they were like, I don't particularly love this song just in general for me, but I can see like you do get like kind of the vision for this project mm-hmm. and it is a good song. And I have this other like instrumental that I've been trying to write to. Can you write a song over this? Yep. And I was like, sure. Sent it back that same day. And they were like, yep. And hired me to write 10 more songs. And then mm-hmm. other people started to as well. <laughs> it is that. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. I think that the most common fault I see, and I think fault is maybe the wrong word there, but the most common reservation, the most common hesitancy, the most common place I think people get stuck at is this fear of trying stuff. And I've, yeah, even, uh, I, whatever. I was going to say, I shouldn't say this. And it's like, ah, whatever. I got a message on Instagram, just some guy being like, Hey, how is it to learn this? Like, what was your experience learning this? And it was a valid question, but to me, it's also like, Hey, go learn it. Like, I, I can't tell you this thing was hard or easy to learn. Like it's, yeah, it's an effort to start a conversation. That's very flattering. But what stuck out to me is like, uh, there are people who are willing to make that leap of like, just go figure it out. And there are people who want like someone to help them through Guide that. them, yeah. And I think both of those are valuable and I'm, I've also needed guidance in times in my life, but I think that there's something that unites our, our industry of people of like, we're all the people who it's like, I don't care if it's hard or easy. If I want to figure it out, yeah. I'm going to figure it out. And that yeah. is what it is. Uh, and I, I, I always laugh at it. It's like, we are defined as an industry who is like bad in school. Like it's a, yeah, it's almost like similar to the jock thing. Like you never think if you're good at sports, you're good at school. Of course, yeah. there is a lot of overlap <clears throat> in the high levels there. Um, but I think with us, it's like, yeah, if when I tell people I make music videos for a living, I don't think that they go, oh, he's smart. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right? Like, that's never the first thing that people think. But it is this ambitious, like, bravery that I think it takes. And same with for producing sure. or being in a band or getting on stage. Uh, and it always like, makes me laugh of, like, we are, I don't know, somehow choosing to be black sheep. But it's like, we're really not that black of sheep. No, which yeah. Sounds a lot worse coming out of my mouth than it did in, in principle. Um, oh, yeah, the most common thing I think I get when... I tell people like, oh, yeah, I'm a full-time mixing engineer. First, they're just like, what is that? And then when I explain it, they're like, oh, like, yeah, I've heard of that. I've never met anyone else that does that. (laughs) It's like, well. I hate telling people what I do. Is that your experience? Like, when I'm traveling, I've been playing golf, and so I get partnered up with senior citizens sometimes, and I love it because me and 70-year-olds are right about the same level. Nice. (laughs) Uh, But they always want to chat about, yeah, what do you do for work? And I'm always like, Fuck. Yeah. I don't like I this is never gonna make sense to you or it's gonna yeah. be so many questions. Like, do you have the same like ugh, moment when people ask you? Yeah, especially because like it can go one of two ways. Either they're like, Oh, that's really cool, mm-hmm. like that you, you know, built your own like company and work yeah. for yourself and do basically a hobby for a living and yeah. it seems to be going well. Yeah. Or they're like, um yep. <laughs> and it's like no, I'm good. Don't worry. Like we're we're cool. Yeah, you don't have to feel that bad for me. Yeah, or like I've had I've had people ask me like I've said I do music videos for a living. They go, oh, what do you get paid for a video? Like what does that even go for? And it's like that's if I told you I was a doctor, would your yeah. next question be like how much is yeah. surgery? How much are your costs? paychecks? Like, that's, <laughs> like, it's like it's such this weird like yeah people take it so casually and I think we take yeah. uh, you're right I think we take a hobby very seriously and it is a hobby it is a passion project and it is also a living and I think yeah people. So don't always understand that. But it's also a weird thing of like, I'm so proud of what I do. Like I Oh in, sure. Yeah. I in the same breath that I want to talk about only what I do, I literally never want to talk about what I do. And yeah. it's this weird dichotomy that I'm always Now that Caden's in school, like mm-hmm. we'll like play on the playground oh, with his friends that. and yeah. stuff. Dude, talking to the other parents is like most of them are really cool, but yeah. like there was one day where a mom was just like kept asking me questions <laughs> about like what I do. And at one point she's just like, So do you have like because I was kind of just like, ah, oh, like for like, I have sessions booked in person a lot of the time, but mm-hmm. like, on you know, a few days a week, I kind of just work like whenever I want, like on my like remote work or whatever I'm doing. So she's like, But do you have like deadlines and stuff? I'm like, Yeah, like <laughs> I can't just like leave projects in limbo forever. Like, I, I, I do have to like get work done, but yep. I just get to do it when it's convenient for me. Like, <laughs> yep, I have the same thing. Yes, I was golfing the other day, and it was a Tuesday afternoon. I like to go in the middle of the day when no one's out, so it's just me and senior citizens. And someone goes, "So, like, how are you here? Like, do you ever have to work? Like, why do you just have today off?" And it's like, I don't. I worked all morning. I'm working tonight, and I have two hours today to yeah. enjoy. Let me enjoy it, lady. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's always this weird. Like, uh, I don't know, and I also feel like I'm. Uh, I think that there is some 
some benefit to the world we're doing when we talk about what we do for work. And I think especially the context of kids and the context of people who are also ambitious still and not that we're going to change a 60 year old life direction, but I think in the context of Caden's friends or even the parents there who are yeah. stuck in a life that maybe isn't the most fulfilling version of what they think a life could be. It's like, I think it's important for people like us to say, no, I did it and it's, or I'm doing it and it's possible and it's not yeah. perfect. I'm maybe not one rich. of those kids is going to grow up and want to do it and they will yeah. hopefully not persuade them not to. <laughs> yes. Or maybe one of these grandmas has a grandkid who's doing it and, my hope is that in talking about it, the grandkid before would have been disowned, not disowned, but yeah, yeah. Uh, judged for doing it in some capacity. And by saying, no, I'm here on a Tuesday afternoon and I'm also doing it successfully. Look at this. Yeah. That I think, yeah, I should talk about it more. It's this yeah. weird balance. It's not that me. I never work because I'm at the playground. <laughs> it's I get to bring my kids to the playground. Yeah. Because I worked while you were sleeping yeah. last night. <laughs> yep. This must be like a, you really get like paying the dividends of all the hard work. I think when you have kids now, like you really get in the, to reap the benefits of it. It must be a really lu luxury that, yeah, a lot of Caden's peers don't have. Yeah. Or their peers' parents don't have there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Time, so. there's nothing better than time. Yeah. So I would rather every day work overnight if I can and spend all day with them and then. Get up and do it again. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Uh, I'm jumping ahead here. We'll come back to the kind of half-hearted train of music videos. My other yeah. thing that I want to touch on here that I think flows with what you're saying uh, is I've, I joked a couple weeks ago that I wanted to build an empire. And I, I got a lot of feedback on the clip of like, very ambitious. And it's like, no, no, no. I don't mean like a... I used to think that meant becoming the Michael Jordan of whatever I was doing. And for a while in my life, it was soccer. And then it was like, well, that's not going to happen. And then you start photo video and it's like, oh, I'll be Michael Jordan of this. And now as I'm, I don't know, seven, 10 years into this, somewhere in there, it's like, I might not be Michael Jordan. That actually might not be in the courts. I think I might have found a little more success if that was the path. But that isn't the only way to build my empire. And I'm slowly realizing that like building an empire isn't being Michael Jordan and even being Michael Jordan, I don't think is as desirable as it seems on paper. I don't think being the greatest is being the happiest. I don't think it's yeah. being the most fulfilled. I think so he's a lot of work that people don't see. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of sacrifice. And I think yeah. in watching the last dance, it struck me as like, I think Michael Jordan suffered a lot for as much as he has earned. And I think he's proud of all he's earned, but I don't get the sense that he's a, a man who's happy in retirement and willing to sit by the pool with his kids all day and drink a beer and just be yeah. and enjoy life. Like, there's some, some emptiness, some some edge that I still sense there. And to me, it's like, okay, well, if being Michael Jordan isn't the goal and it's also not desirable, then cool, okay. But then what is the goal? And I think the one thing I appreciate what we've done is like in building an empire, it's like it doesn't have to be Michael Jordan. It can be being at the playground with your kids and your empire then is this, yeah, it's a much tighter nucleus, but it's a nucleus you can affect. Whereas Michael yeah. Jordan's had a tangential effect on a lot of lives, but it's like, no, one way to build an empire is to build a family, is to build a community. And I think I really appreciate that about what you've done. It's a really cool thing to watch unfold. Does it feel like that's your empire? Like, is I guess then, I guess my question then is, yeah, what is the end goal for you? Is it is it still building this familial empire? Is there some part of you that still is this like, Michael Jordan might be in my future? Like, where is your brain in this? I feel like, <clears throat> yeah, I feel like it was definitely a shift when I had kids. Like, yeah. uh, before then, I was like super focused on like, okay, the studio is cool, definitely one of my passions. Like, I'm always going to do that when I'm not touring. And I'm going to, like, that was, like, the goal. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to just, like, go tour all the time. I'm going to just play shows. Like, Touch the kangaroos and koalas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's going to be a thing. And now I still think that would be cool to, like, tour more and stuff. But I'm so happy now that it was, like, where I'm at. Like, yeah. I definitely shifted to, like, oh, I'm going to have this legacy of where, like, I go out and I, like, affect people's lives. And, like, I always used to say this thing, like, be a spark, like, in this, like, dark world. Like, mm -hmm. like make people happy and, like, ripple affect that. And, like, that's going to be cool. Like, that's going to be my legacy. And then I feel like when I had Caden, it was, like, <clears throat> shortly after I realized, like, you're my legacy. Like, yeah. I can make you go do great things. And that's even, like, cooler. Yeah. <laughs> And then Taylor, I assume, reinforces that even further. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, has having the second kid changed anything in that perspective or just, yeah, further reinforced what the first kid kind of taught you? Yeah, kind of. I mean, like, my relationship with them is, like, different because they're such different little kids. But, yeah, same, like, perspective. It's just, like, now I can mold you and grow you into hopefully something awesome where you can now make the decision, like, do you want to go have mass impact or do you want to just impact – my grandkids now, I guess. Like. <laughs> what a wild sentence to come out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, um, 
Ah, uh, shoot. I just had a follow-up thought there that was something I wanted to express, and I'm drawing a blank on what it was. Oh, um, mm-hmm. uh, I often tell the story on this podcast, and I, I joke it's one of the ones that I've probably nauseated. People are nauseated by hearing at this point. Uh, but at some point you told me that uh, I think – I'm almost positive it was you, that you were saying that you walked into the room and Caden was on the floor with his iPad and he was searching like how to tie his shoes or some some like mundane task. And the the observation you took away that resonated with me is like how powerful it is that a kid who was three or four at the time could go on YouTube and solve the problem. Uh, as you're now talking about like empowering them to build the world, is there some fear that like YouTube's going to teach them? It won't be me. Like how do you balance these two like influences in their lives? No, I think that's cool. I think that YouTube and like the internet and the fact that like if I can set them up to figure out how to utilize those things like correctly to Mm -hmm. where like, like I think for me to be insanely successful with them, they won't need me like sooner rather than later. Like, uh, like if, if we hit the point where they're 30 and I'm 60 almost, (laughs) uh, and I have to go to them and be like, hey, how do I do this? Like, And they know I won because yeah. I gave them the skills to, to figure that out and they're killing it on their own. I don't want them to be like relying on me forever. I like that. Yeah. Uh, how does that then affect the career side of things then? So if I think as the focus shifts, I guess I'm always uh, almost scared, I guess, to take on other things in my life and not that kids are a thing I could choose to take on tomorrow, but like I... I cherish how singularly focused I could be on my work. And I think as life grows and evolves, you get less focused on things because there's just less time in the day to be focused on stuff. Yeah. I assume when you started this thing, there is some party that wants me, Michael Jordan. As life goes on, does that still feel like the, the end goal or is there an end goal for audio? Like I always, I've heard people say that like the best way to do entertainment as an industry is to have an output is to know that like, I'm going to get to here and, have a number that's it is have a moment have an achievement like have something of like a not that if i get here i'll be happy but just be aware of like this can't go forever it's not going to peak forever like for sure is there somewhere that you think this ends this grows to is there somewhere in mind where like if i could yeah where does that future look like to you so as of right now half-hearted is starting to tour again uh in tiny little bits so oh, yeah. i mean it's Just with all of our personal lives, all four of us, me included, it's not practical for us to just dive back in and be like, hey, we're leaving for two, three months. Yeah. Um, But leaving for, you know, four or five days every couple months and kind of building that up is not only like fun and like a vacation for us, but it obviously is going to help the band grow, which is going to help our whole little side business kind of grow. And (laughs) and we're all super into it and we love it. And, you know, that's that's never going to stop. So I think we're going to grow that in a way that makes sense for all of us at the time at just for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Um, my plan kind of on the other end is when I don't want to be home all the time anymore. And like my kids are going to school and stuff. I think it makes most sense for me to like buy or rent a building. And at that point I would kind of split into like, I, I would want that building to have multiple studios, like at least two. So I can, get somebody else working with me that I trust and can kind of train to my standards and Mm -hmm. everything. And me and that person like work simultaneously because that would then double, you know, the amount of work that we can do. And obviously like, yeah, we'd be paying for a building and more equipment and whatever, but now we'd have two people working as many hours as I'm working now. And then I think that over time would evolve into more trusted people and more trusted people until the point where it's like, okay, you guys don't need me around anymore. Here's my building. I'm going to go be old and chill. I'll take 10%. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I've heard a similar advice. And for me, the video, it's like, there's, um, what I heard just, yeah, you either specialize or you generalize, I think is the term I heard. And I guess yours would be the generalize. Like, yeah, you keep taking more people under your umbrella and keep growing what your umbrella looks like. And for me, the camera, it's that it's either, direct and I hire someone to be my director of photography so that they go shoot while I'm home editing, or I become someone's director of photography and I find someone else who has an established thing. Yeah. Uh, and I think I'm wired like you or my, my brain prefers the, the whichever version I said of the one where I'm the one growing in charge and growing my own umbrella. Yep. Um, but I think there, I could imagine a point in my life where I don't want to be the person who has all the risk involved anymore. Sure. Uh, but I think it's interesting that you're yeah continuing to double down on that and going like, I'm going to keep growing my umbrella yeah uh, and i i think that is 
what I will choose to do is interesting to me. Um, I think it's also really scary to imagine having someone else editing my work. Or, and I, as you're ma- talking about mixing, like it, uh, I think you mentioned that Jay does a little stuff once in a while of some stuff, but like that's very different than having a, a, a partner, someone else in the studio. And I assume in the uh, traditional model of the, uh, there's names on the tip of my tongue. And I'll leave the names out of this, but there's a big producer out in the Michigan area who had a sure. another producer <laughs> under him who was very popular. And I know that there was a, a lot of drama there of like, you think you're getting A and you get B and people actually really liked B, but it's yeah. not A that you paid for. And it seems like this whole nother world of trouble where it's like, I don't know. I, I think as, as I grow, as I get more people under my umbrella, it would just introduce more problems that I don't want to solve. Like there's some weird, like bliss of like, Oh, I want to stay right in this. I want to stay right where I am. I don't want to go a step higher or a step lower. Yeah. Uh, and it's this strange, but it's like, that's not sustainable. Like you can't stay here forever. It has to go up or down. Um, is it then exciting to you to have someone else that you could like teach and inspire or is it it to me it's a stressful thing to me it's like i don't think i'm teaching and inspiring anyone it's like a you know i don't want to yeah i know what it's taking me to get here and i don't have time to give that all to you <laughs> like it's yeah. i need you to do it no i think that's exciting like i think i would like i would really enjoy like having like especially somebody coming like maybe not out of college or like just somebody who maybe knows little to nothing Mm -hmm. and they come in and I'm kind of just like, let's open this world up for you. Kind of like, here's, here's, here's like how it's done. Like how I do it. Like, so there's no conflicting, like, Oh, I I was taught this way or like whatever. Like it would be somebody kind of continuing like exactly how I do things. I am in a situation similar to that currently. Uh, and I'm somewhat comfortable talking about it because I don't think it'll end up in their ears as I say it, but I'll be a little vague. But like what I've learned is the opposite of like, uh, I thought I would want someone who's a clean slate. And the questions that I get sometimes are like, man, I haven't thought about that in so long. <laughs> yeah. And it's crazy that I have to teach this part to you before we could teach you this part yeah. that I'm actually interested in. True. And it's this like, I guess there's like a, a threshold. There. Happy medium. It's like, yeah, yeah. like you should. You should be, you should have been in the studio before. Maybe you're in a band that's recorded. Like, yeah. you, you kind of get the process. I think like, it's also, a, you know what each piece of gear is. Yeah. And I, then, I like, think it's also a people thing too. Like, uh, the person I'm thinking of is a likable person. So, even though, like, sometimes I, I struggle to, like, yeah, sometimes I'm not always excited to answer all the questions, but it's like they're likable and willing enough to learn that I'm happy to facilitate that. Yeah. And I think in the context of the studio, it probably would be a similar thing if it would be more about finding someone that you like and whose energy you're willing to invest in than it is about finding someone who can mix well because definitely. to some degree mixing is a lot more learnable than it is to be personable oh, or definitely. yeah a good I feel hang. like that goes to like for anything yeah. like almost especially in our industry like yeah. I feel like the people who are good hangs will get more jobs than the people who are just already good that are miserable to be around like every yeah. time <laughs> yep yeah and everyone i feel like all my friends have a story of we went to the person who we thought was cool and they're a nightmare and we're not going back there yeah, again. no matter how it comes and that's yeah. the crazy thing too is like i feel like when i have people in studio one of my main focuses is like i want you to have a really good day mm-hmm. like i want at the end of the day we need to have a really cool song that we both want to go listen to and that's Definitely not going to happen if you don't have a good day. Because if you have a shitty day while we're making this song, every time you listen to it, you're going to be put right back in that spot of like, this was miserable to do. And if you, on the flip side, if you have a really good day all day and we're, you know, have a great hang and every little step of the way, it's like fun and interesting and experimental. At the end of the day, when you leave with that song, you're going to be like, this is a part of me. And every time I listen to it, it brings me back to that, like, really fun day I had when I made it. And, like, that feeling is, like, addicting. Like, once you have that feeling of, like, I made something really cool and every time I listen to it, it makes me feel like I did something really cool you're just going to chase that forever. <laughs> yes, I agree 100% that, yeah, it's all about that. And I'm always grateful that I only have to worry about that for my one day on set. And for the other two weeks of the project, I don't have to worry about that. And I can just be alone in my room. And I'm yeah. always envious, or not envious, I, I don't envy. I actively, like, uh, dread what you guys have to go through of being a... I and mean, it's a barbershop situation to me. It's a similar comparison there. But it's like, it is a an artistic skill, but 
because the person is there the whole time, it is so much more. And you have to be a customer service person where I get yeah. to, for for most of my project, I don't have to worry about that. I can just be alone in my room and be in my sweats and be the worst, ver- whatever version of myself, well, best or worst, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and there's a freedom there that I really appreciate that I think would stress me out to have be in office or in studio with someone. And I guess if, if I were to grow, that'd be something I have to get over. Is like I have to get used to having an editor over my shoulder, someone else, yeah, to negotiate and bounce ideas with. Yeah. Uh, and I'm... I'm bad at that currently. It feels like a it feels like a yellow light. It's like I want all green lights. I don't got time for any yellow lights here. Yeah. Just give me green lights, which probably has its own down downfalls in itself. Um, Makes my job more fun too because yeah. then like if if my main one of my main focuses all day every session is like let's both have a great day. Nine point nine times out of ten, like I end up becoming like really good friends with everyone I'm working yeah. with. So then my job becomes like, okay, I look at my calendar for the month and I'm like, okay, like almost every single day this month, like I'm just hanging out with my friends. Like mm-hmm. these are people that I hang out with when I'm not working and they're just coming over to like work this day. Yeah. And it's like that's that's when it becomes like really fun. <laughs> yeah. And they always say that the journeys and the process, the journeys or the enjoyments in the process, the enjoyments in the climb, whatever those, yeah. those cliches. And I think that's exactly where we're at. And there's some, yeah, I think you're right to, to appreciate that. And I think I, I would do better to appreciate that more often of like, I, I, I really enjoy what I do. And I think that, yeah, it becomes a, I don't know, a thing I'm outputting. And I think that there's a really wise, wise nature to what you said of like, yeah, stop and smell the roses and go, I, I am doing it to some degree. Like I, as I go yeah. back to my 18 year old self who would have killed not to have a day job. It's like, I'm, I'm doing that. Like at, at the very least, like whether I'm Michael Jordan or not, I, I have yeah. at least made it this far and that's worth taking, yeah, taking your breath and playing around to golf on Tuesday with my grandma friends. Yeah. Sometimes uh, I get way ahead of myself and yeah. I'm like, start to get frustrated. And yeah. then, yeah, you got to stop and think like, all right, 16 year old me working at the bowling alley would be ecstatic <laughs> to do this for yeah. one day and yeah. I'm doing it every day. Like, yeah. and my dad's always on me about that. He's always just like, yeah, like you're doing fine. You're doing better every month, better every year. Like, yep. chill, take a day, go be yep. a person, watch a movie or something <laughs> that's not obsess over work for like yep. 10 seconds. Yep. Yeah. I, I have like I, two modes. It's like I'm dead and like that's the my only focus right now. And then like if I'm not doing that, it's like I'm working. Everyone's asleep. I'm not hanging out and watching TV. I'm working. Like, I'm mm-hmm. doing something. Yep. I have the same thing. And, yeah, I, I can't imagine adding a dad inside to that capacity as well. So, yeah, always a lot on your plate there. Uh, I realize we skipped past a lot of the half-hearted music videos. We're coming up on our hour. So that's A-OK okay with me. Uh, I enjoyed our little detour there. Uh, the one, are there any videos here that I super want to chat about more than others? Uh, the couple on my list here, and I guess I'll ask you if there's any that stand out. Uh, the couple on my list here are Be My Religion. Uh, which I love the lyric video for. And I think that the the video as a whole, like the transition between the scenes, I don't love, but there's like a church scene for the chorus that has always stuck out to my brain. Yeah. It's like a, I really love cool. that. I really love that. I really love that one, how that came out. Uh, the other two on my tip, of my tongue here are help me find the words and seeing, uh, seeing color, uh, which are both videos where it's like, I love the full band stuff. And I think I sold myself short on like the solo shots there. And so it was fun to look back then and compare it with love mistakes of like, no, that's not a, a main shot and a filler shot. These are three main shots all yep. the way through. So it's kind of fun to reflect on the the progress there. Uh, are there any music videos that stand out in your brain as you reflect on this 11 video run that we've been on or a couple other videos interjected there? But yeah, 11 with me. I would definitely say like the same ones, like help me find the words really stands out. Like that was really cool. Mm-hmm. Jay was just talking about that last night. I guess he's kind of stumbled into the like fact, the unfortunate fact that uh, darker videos don't do as well on ads as the bright ones that makes sense and I he had kept a- he kept just being like oh the ads for help me find the words like with just like the plants and the sun and the like white room and like he was like that was just like the ads on that just went crazy just because it yeah. looked like that and he's like i'm trying to make all these dark videos work and it's just like tough like interesting like, even if the video is just objectively mm-hmm. cooler and better if it's darker yep something about it it makes a lot of sense as well yeah yeah we we like pastels we like bright stuff and there's yeah. a reason that there is no brand that identifies in black and white right all the lysols all the tylenols they all have a bright red a bright green like a bright color that yeah. smacks us in the face and the commercials are all bright and outside and yeah it is that there's something eye-catching there that i think gets lost in darker stuff which is annoying because I like darker stuff. So yeah. I'll have to chat with and, Jay. And, yeah. And a lot of times it's like, you know, it's like, how do I, like, 
lo- the love mistakes video couldn't have been bright. Mm-hmm. Like that would just not make sense sure. artistically. Like, yeah. Okay. Maybe like the ad we'd get five cents less per click or whatever, but it wouldn't make sense. Like it wouldn't mm-hmm. resonate as much with yep. the people who did click through, you know? So it's like, yeah, I guess toting that fine line of like, what's going to be artistically cool and right for the song and what's going to like, unfortunately do well in the algorithm yeah. world. What's a commercial <laughs> success and what's an artistic success. I think yeah. they're two, unfortunately, very different things that I think that we would all love to unify a little better, but yeah. doesn't seem to be happening anytime soon. I think the more I, I, the more I'm not on TikTok, the more I believe I should be. And I'm trying to make more of an effort to invest into that. Cause like, I, I think that's the hot hand and I'm dumb to, invest in the old way still and it's like i i still like instagram and twitter but i don't believe that that is the the cutting edge of the best way to share my work with more people and i think that generally that myself for sure with myself and i think generally with artists as a whole we're very good at creating art and not good at telling other people that we created the art uh and so that's been a challenge i've been trying to work on it's like yeah i gotta i gotta get better i think i make cool stuff but i gotta get better at telling other people and reminding yeah. other people that stuff exists because that's my job. Finding to do. new people is yes. the hardest thing. It's like yeah. you could tell your friends, your you know, yeah. five thousand friends on Facebook or whatever, the same yeah. thing every day. And, and to some this, degree, I have told them all yeah. the same thing every day. Right yeah. after TikTok comes the, in, the same hopefully. handful of people yeah. are going to interact with it no matter yeah. what. Yep. And the the Dale friends are going to miss everything mm-hmm. you put out and then like it later. <laughs> but then it's like, yeah, TikTok <laughs> is like the only one that's good at like, hey, here's something you've never seen before. Like, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and, I and I'm sure TikTok is only like going to be around for that's going to be like the thing for probably not that long, and then there'll be something I'm else. I'm sure we're on the back end of that, right? I've yeah. heard people describe podcasting the same way as that. Ten years ago, it was the Wild West, and at this point, the the money has left the industry from from the top, and all that money is now into TikTok and all the other stuff. And yeah, I'm a long way away from having to worry about <laughs> that as a podcast myself, but it's an interesting thing of like, yeah, this world changes quick, and once you accept that this is the thing, it's already not the thing anymore. Yeah. Um, cool. Hell yeah, man. Episode 45, mission accomplished. We did, did it, it, Sean Dalkey. Let's go. Uh, anything we want to plug before we get out of here shows, uh, check out Love Mistakes, song and video streaming everywhere. Um, yeah, check out Love Mistakes and the other three songs we put out this year. Um, some Insatiable, of the, the Fog, and... Voodoo. Voodoo. That yeah. was this, also this year. Damn. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. I like that one as well. Yeah, so those will all be bundled up with a couple new ones on an EP that comes out like really soon, like within the next couple months. Uh, we're going to do a headline EP release show at the Webster very early next year, right around the time of there, just to kind of reinforce that. Hell yeah. And a uh, couple little runs in the spring, and then even more new music. Big things <laughs> coming soon, man. Uh, yep. And just to reinforce again, if you want to book you for music, uh, what's the best way to reach you again? Uh, go on my Instagram or Facebook or com and fill out the little contact flyer thing. Hell yeah. Go hang out with the house. Go meet his dog. Uh, go meet Odin. I called him Otis one time, and Caden looked at me like, who the fuck is Otis? And I was like, oh, You're off by one letter. I have no idea who you're talking about. And the adult would be like, oh, I got you. And yeah. he was like, that's not oh, a person. He, yeah, he won't cut you slack. <laughs> he won't cut anyone slack. slack. Yeah. Uh, no. Well deserved, though. All right, thanks for coming through episode 45 in the book. Thank you. Mm-hmm.